Starting off at number 10 is Fire Mountain. In the mid 90s, Fire Mountain was an unbuilt roller coaster that park officials were considering adding to the Adventureland area of the Magic Kingdom. The ride was based on the film Atlantis The Lost Empire and would have taken park goers to an active volcano located between Splash Mountain and Pirates of the Caribbean. The story of the ride was set in 1916. Preston Whitmore is trying to make Atlantis's existence public and starts offering expeditions to visitors. The vehicles they're in are forced to unexpectedly take a detour through the volcano. Mm. But the whole plan was cancelled due to the film doing shockingly bad and underperforming at the box office. The ride was originally designed to be built to compete with Universal Studios Islands of Adventure, but after visiting it and basically realizing that it was a mess and no threat to Walt Disney World, they decided to just cancel the whole construction of this ride. <laughs> when we visited them, they're like, this ain't <laughs> They're like, oh, this is our competition? Yeah. <laughs> Never <Okay>. mind. <laughs> <laughs> In our ninth spot, we have The Nightmare Before Christmas. I am disappointed that this project never got finished because I'm a huge fan of The Nightmare Before Christmas and Jack Skellington. It's just a classic movie. Is it a movie to watch during Halloween? Is it a movie to watch during Christmas? The answer is, it's a movie to watch during both of my favorite holidays. Like, that's amazing. But anyways, The Nightmare Before Christmas ride was going to be built beside the evil It's a Small World ride at Disneyland. Seriously, that ride is is cursed or something. It was going to have guests in a flying coffin help Jack save Christmas. And at the end of the ride, it was going to show Jack and Sally hugging in the snow, how cute. But for some reason, the project was scrapped. However, every year from Halloween to Christmas, Disneyland redecorates the Haunted Mansion ride to be Nightmare Before Christmas themed. So, in a way, we get our nightmare fix, but not in the way that they originally intended. At number eight, we have Pop Century Resorts. So the foundation of the resort had two parts to it, the legendary years and the classic years, and those two parts were connected by a bridge called the Generation Gap. Very literal and ironic, I know. But the legendary years would have represented the 1900s all the way to the 40s, and the classic years would have represented the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. The original plan was for the resort to open in 2001, but then due to construction delays, it was pushed back another year. And then 9-11 happened, which plummeted tourism to basically nothing. The opening was then postponed again because there was zero demand for hotel rooms. Construction on the classic year's side continued until its opening in 2003, but the legendary year's side hasn't been touched since 2001. In 2006, Disney announced they would restart construction on the abandoned side, but that never happened. LOL. In 2010, it was announced Disney's Art of Animation Resort would be replacing the legendary side, but the original buildings still stand. As for the classic year side, we don't talk about that no more. Making our way down the list to number 7, we have the Food Rocks. Food Rocks was opened in 1994 and featured a musical show with animatronic figures. Kind of like the Chuck E. Cheese band, but more classy in a way and less scary. I don't think it can be classy in any way. Well, I don't know. But the Chuck E. Cheese band is terrifying with their really evil eyes. The Food Rocks was an animatronic show in the Land Pavilion at Epcot. It opened in 1994 and was all about the importance of eating healthy. The animatronics were different types of food, but with human features. They then would make funny parodies of songs like Every Breath You Take was every bite you take. That's a great song, first of all. <laughs> Just wanted to put that out there. The, the Vaudeville style show was basically meant to teach kids about the four food groups, but was eventually shut down in 2004. But according to Modern Mouse Radio, the whole stage was left intact and is just hidden behind the walls. Even the animatronic figures are said to be resting behind the walls, so while you're queuing up for that flight simulator ride, just remember those singing food items are right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. Can you imagine if they just started uh, singing all of a sudden? They're like, every bite you take. <laughs> Dude, I'd get so scared. I'm like, where is this like, What from? is this coming from? Are you hearing that? Like, where is that? <laughs> it's so creepy. In our sixth spot, we have the Beastly Kingdom. The original plans for the Animal Kingdom was supposed to incorporate three categories of animals. Real, extinct, and imaginary. So, the Beastly Kingdom was supposed to be a section of the Animal Kingdom Park, that focused on mythological animals. They had plans to have a quest of the unicorn hedge maze, a boat ride based on Fantasia, and even a massive castle home to a fire-breathing dragon. Like, that sounds awesome. And that castle's dragon was planned to be the largest animatronic creature in the whole park. Now, there is no conclusive reason as to why this idea was abandoned, 
But every year there is new hope that Disney will follow through with this idea. Coming in at number 5 is Walt Disney's Riverfront Square. Ok so this project was a huge deal because it was meant to be Disney's second park after the one in California. Now if you weren't aware, Walt Disney grew up in Missouri so in 1963 he met up with St. Louis's mayor to talk about the plans. It was meant to be a theme park right by the riverfront area which worked out since the area was already undergoing renovations due to a city celebration. The park would have taken up two blocks and its entrance would have been very similar to Disneyland's main street one. Attractions like the Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the Caribbean and the Western Riverboat Ride were all meant to be at this park. Unfortunately the plans for the park completely fell through in 1965 due to financial and ownership issues. Walt then turned all his focus to the Walt Disney World in Florida and I mean it's a good thing he did too, that one's vibing. At number 4 is the People Mover. So this ride was essentially a transport attraction that opened up at Tomorrowland at Disneyland California back in 1967. Park goers would board these small trains that toured around Tomorrowland from above and as fun as safe as that ride sounds it really wasn't. A month into the ride being in operation a 16 year old guy tripped and fell onto the track and the oncoming trains crushed him and dragged his body for a few hundred feet before actually stopping. Can you imagine having a death only one month into the ride? opening. That is not a good track record. And no, that is not the only death the ride caused. Was that a was that a pun in, intended? Yes. This is not a good track. <laughs> <laughs> that was clever. Tis. I like that. <laughs> But seriously, that is terrifying. But that wasn't the reason why the ride was closed. The ride was closed in August of 1995 because the Disney team thought that it was too old school. As a result, it was replaced by the Rocket Rods three years later, which then didn't last too long as well. But not to fear, a lot of the pieces of the train from the original ride are still used in other parts around the resort. And the track is still in Tomorrowland, just unused. In 2010, Disney announced that the ride was coming back. But it's been 10 years and nothing has happened. So let's just hope that they get that whole death by ride thing figured out. Yeah. We don't need any more of those. 10 years, I don't think the comeback's happening. No, <laughs> it's definitely nope. not. <laughs> coming in at number three, we have Cranium Command. The Wonder of the Life Pavilion had a short-lived life. It opened in October of 1989 and closed in 2007. The pavilion was designed to be educational yet fun. It focused all about the human body. Now, one of the rides at this attraction was called Cranium Command. For this ride, guests were sent on a mission into the human brain of a 12 year old boy. Yeah, not creepy at all. You were then called a Cranium Commando and alongside Buzzy, a tiny soldier, you would help complete this mission. Not gonna lie, I've seen footage from this ride and it looks really creepy. So you're inside a theater that is designed to look like you're inside this boy's head. So you're inside his head, looking out of his eyes, seeing what he is seeing. Then it's kind of like a simulator ride where you just watch the story unfold while your chair vibrates and moves to whatever is happening. But unfortunately, this ride was abandoned after having one of their sponsors back out. Now at number 2 is Discovery Island. This 11.5 acre island is located on Walt Disney World's property and was actually open to guests between 1974 to 1999. Walt bought the island in 1965 and it was initially called Treasure Island. Park goers went there to look at wildlife because it was essentially a miniature zoo. You could look at animals like flamingos, swans and more. Fun fact, the island's facilities were the last known home of the dusky seaside sparrow before it went extinct. Things got ugly in 1989 when Peter accused Disney of mistreating vultures that landed on the island. Disney actually even confirmed this by saying some of the birds died while employees tried to capture them. Officials then charged him with 16 counts of animal cruelty but they were eventually dropped. The island closed in 1999 for undisclosed reasons and all of its animals got moved to Disney's Animal Kingdom. The island is still there just sitting there abandoned with zero signs of development. Funnily enough, a man went to the island in April of this year during the pandemic. He called it a tropical paradise and had no idea it was off limits. He was soon arrested. And finally in our number one spot is River Country Park. River Country Park opened in 1976 and was the first water park at Walt Disney World. The park was designed to look like a swimming hole and had fake mountains with water slides. But a lot of tragedy occurred at this park which contributed to being shut down. 
In 1980, a boy was killed at the park after getting a bacterial infection from one of the pool's water. The bacteria attacked his brain and nervous system, which then killed him. Um, I was smiling all throughout she was talking about that death. I wasn't smiling at the death, I was just smiling at something Lindsay did beforehand. Like, I'm <laughs> up some sadistic fool. Either way, I digress. Then, just two years later, another boy passed away at the park. Sadly, he drowned after coming off of one of the water slides. Like, shortly after the first death, they would have improved things, you know, installed more safety measures, at least something. I guess not, because then in 1989, another boy drowned there. What's creepy is that their advertisements read, Bring a swimsuit and a smile. You're likely to wear both out at River Country. More like bring a swimsuit and a death wish. Like seriously, it's tragic what happened there. Oh god. The park then closed its doors in November of 2001, but most of it is still there. In fact, some say that the park is now haunted. People have speculated that the land is permanently cursed with bad luck, which is what makes it very attractive to urban explorers who go there. Mm, we should go there for a future video. Oh, mm. I don't know about that. <laughs> Starting off this countdown, we have the Western River Expedition. The Western River Expedition was going to be a huge theme park attraction at Magic Kingdom. It was planned to be a Western themed boat ride, narrated by an owl by the name of Hoot Gibson. He would guide you through a bunch of scenes like a bank robbery or one with prairie dogs and buffalo. And of course, there was going to be cowboys. Hoot Gibson, like I'm <laughs> dying at how cute that right? name is. <laughs> now originally the plan was to have a Pirates of the Caribbean themed ride at Magic Kingdom, but Disney thought that this wouldn't be a huge deal for Floridians since pirates are rife in their urban legends. But when the park finally opened up, everyone was super disappointed and kept asking the same question. Where are the pirates? As a result, they never went through with building this ride. Instead, they figured out they should give the people what they want and make a ride based on the Pirates of the Caribbean. Plus, they realized that this ride would be several million dollars cheaper cheaper to build. So they were like, screw it, let's save the 60 mil and build this pirate ride. Coming in at number 9 is Port Disney. So this one was a huge deal. It was meant to be 443 acres and have a whole marine themed amusement park, a cruise ship port, a marina, hotels, and a whole retail and entertainment district. It's like a whole little like little city almost. Disney Sea was a theme park that was going to be built there and it featured every aquatic themed ride you could possibly think of. But considering how big the project was, there was a lot of local opposition and people didn't want the added traffic from tourists and they also didn't think Disney deserved public subsidies for the project considering they were a very successful private corporation. Then the California Coastal Commission told Disney that by the way your plans are great and all but a huge bulk of the project is not permitted under the Coastal Act so what are you literally even doing? The mayor of Long Beach also ended up announcing that he didn't think the project made sense for the city or for Disney. Yikes. The project was shelved in 1991 and replaced by the planned West Cop Park that also eventually got abandoned too. Making our way down the list at number 8 we have the Muppets. Due to the incredible success of MGM Studios Muppet Vision 3D ride, Disney began working with Jim Henson, the creator of the Muppets, to include more Muppet themed stuff around the park. They had plans to create a restaurant and ride similar to the great movie ride, but it would star the Muppets. One of the things they had planned was a pizza parlor featuring Rizzo the Rat and Gonzo, but sadly Jim Henson died shortly after. And and the plans to have a Muppet takeover were cancelled. Imagine if the plans did go through though, there would be a Kermit the Frog themed everything. They need to have a Kermit's tea shop though and have the logo as the, you know, the Kermit sipping the tea meme. That would have been great. Well, that's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> Filling out number seven slot is a recess the first day of school. So Disney hasn't just abandoned a bunch of attractions, it's also shelved a lot of movies. And although I didn't have Disney growing up, for the one year I did have it, I just overdosed on recess. The show was just so good. It was a great time, always good vibes. And this movie was meant to be a prequel to the show to kind of show how the whole series even came to be. You'd think they would have covered the origin story in one of the four recess movies already, but evidently they did not. So I'm assuming that the movie would have shown how the characters met and became friends or something like that. But we will never know, since Disney released zero teasers or information about the movie before they abandoned the project altogether. Which is a tease if you ask me. Like you can't just announce a recess movie and then not go through <laughs> with it. Either the idea was embarrassingly terrible or they didn't think the movie was going to be a big success. Either way, I wish they shared just a tiny bit of information on this project. Literally, I feel like it would have done well. 
like that. Re anything go. recess done, does yeah. well. Now at number six is the Persian Resort. So this project was essentially meant to be a themed hotel built for Disney World Florida. The hotel was gonna have this 24 foot dome on the main building, which is very typical of like Persian architecture. I would have loved it. It was gonna be located north of the Contemporary Resort and east of the Magic Kingdom, and you could have gotten there via monorail. That's pretty damn cool. Apparently the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, even offered to pay for the whole thing until of course the whole 1973 oil crisis happened. The project was cancelled along with the planned Venetian resort and Asian resort. The Shah still offered to finance the project and told the Iranian revolution after which the project just got the axe for good. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Mythica. Now there is little known about Mythica. In fact, we don't even know when it was in development. Nonetheless, it was a real concept that was going to be at Disneyland. So apparently Mythica was going to be the name of a land with scenery, rides, and dining, all inspired by Greek and Roman mythology. Okay, as someone who loves Greek mythology, like I'm a huge nerd, I just love this idea. Wouldn't it be so cool? Like you could have rides based on the Greek gods. Like you could have a splash water roller coaster ride for Poseidon or a fire mountain ride for Hades. The ideas are endless. You could even have a section dedicated to Hercules. Like, come on, Disney, I got the ideas, you got the money, let's make this happen. At number four is My Peoples. The concept of this movie is so cute, I'm actually quite sad it never got made, despite only learning about its existence like half an hour ago. Sometimes you just don't know what you're missing, you know, until it's just right there in front of you. A set in Texas during the 40s, this movie would follow two families, the McGees and the Harpers, and as you can guess, the two did not get along. It's kind of a bit like Romeo and Juliet, since the family's children, Elgin and Rose, fall in love while the families try to keep them apart. So cute. But then the movie does get a bit weird and Elgin starts to create dolls out of household objects. But this is Disney, so the dolls end up coming to life after an accident occurs involving a magic potion. The living dolls end up helping the families come together and I genuinely think it would have been such a hit. The movie was scrapped in favor of Chicken Little and as cute as that movie was when I watched it, I would have loved the peoples as well. Maybe even more, you know mm, what I mean? Same, it's a good idea. Maybe they thought it was too similar to Romeo and Juliet, but then again, those creepy doll things. Yeah, literally, household dolls. Mm. I love it. Filling our number three slot is Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers. So if you're unaware, Disney planned on their 1990 film Dick Tracy to be a massive hit. Plot twist, it absolutely wasn't. But before its release, the company had huge hopes for the franchise and Imagineers were planning out the ride Crime Stoppers. It was meant to emulate a high speed chase throughout Chicago with Tommy Guns and the whole works. A press release was even put out announcing the oh so revolutionary ride and then when the film tanked, they just tried to pretend like the ride was never even a thing, just sweeping it under the rug and pretending it just didn't exist. At least the Tommy guns didn't go to waste though, they end up paving the way for the Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin shooting adventure, so yeah, you win some, you lose some. In our second spot, we have the Museum of the Weird. The Museum of the Weird was going to be the ultimate inception. It was going to be an attraction inside of an attraction. So it was going to be at the beginning of the Haunted Mansion attraction. It was going to include odd stuff like a chair that stood up and talked along with other weird things collected from around the world. This concept was created by Walt Disney himself after thinking of all the unusual concepts one of his Imagineers came up with. He then figured he would combine them all in the Museum of Weird. But sadly, the plan was canceled after the Haunted Mansion attraction was turned into a ride-through attraction. However, some of the designs are currently featured at this attraction, including the wallpaper used on the walls in the corridor of doors scene. And in our number one spot, we have Lost in Scaradice. <laughs> I love the name of this. So this one was going to be another Disney film. Any guesses as to what sequel of a classic Disney movie was going to be called Lost in Scaradice? Hmm? Monsters Inc! That's right, before Monsters University, Disney was working on releasing a film where Mike and Sully visited Boo for her birthday in the human world. But they discovered that the family moved and so the whole film surrounds them trying to find Boo. Okay, I personally am a really big fan of this film concept. Like, that's such a cute idea. I would have loved this film if it got made. I honestly watched Monsters Inc. when I was small, but I don't remember any of it. I love the movie. <laughs> I love it. Put that thing back where it came from, also help me, so help me. I love it. <laughs> It's so good. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> it's such a good movie. It's so 
good. That was Sorry. So cute. Yeah. <laughs> but the idea was cancelled and replaced with Monsters University, also one that I have not seen. Now the reason being was because Disney shut down the studio that was making it, Circle 7. But this company was created originally to create sequels for Disney-owned Pixar movies, but after it was shut down, Pixar went on to create Monsters University. I still want another Monsters Inc. movie. But I have a feeling that the end of the movie, they, they find that Boo and her family was just on vacation the whole time and they all lived happily ever after. Pretty sure I just guessed the ending. <laughs> if not, then you're welcome, Disney. I just gave you a great ending idea. Now, starting us off at number 10 is the search for Mickey Mouse. Now, this project was a pretty big deal since it was meant to celebrate Mickey Mouse's 75th anniversary, so I thought it was only fitting that I started with this one. So the plot was meant to follow all the original characters like Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy, and Basil of Baker Street. I don't know why Daisy Duck got cut from the squad, but evidently she did. That's a bit savage. But the movie would follow the group on their quest for finding Mickey, and while on the adventure, they were going to run into a bunch of different Disney characters like Peter Pan, Aladdin, Alice, etc. Now, how boss would this film have been? Cameos from everyone. But apparently, the reason the project got cancelled was due to lack of ideas. The writers were finding it really hard to think of an interesting story that made sense whilst integrating all the character cameos. Honestly, good plot or not, I feel like people would have eaten up a movie with that many cameos and they should have just made it anyway. Coming in at number 9 is Yellow Submarine. Now this one may seem familiar since a little known band called The Beatles made a song of the same name as well as a movie. The original animation came out back in 1968 and the plot centers around a music loving underwater place called Pepperland. It's home to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and the whole town comes under attack from the music hating Blue Meanies. Thus the protagonist goes on an adventure to enlist the help of the four members and bring them back to Pepperland. That was a very general summary of the film. I just wanted you guys to know what happened in it because I sure as did not know. So Disney wanted to create a remake of the movie but there was a slight problem. The original was super trippy to the point it actually really terrified kids and the concept art for the remake would have had the same effect. Robert Zemecki was one of the creators of the remake but since the movie Mars Needs Moms tanked, which he also created, he was given no artistic freedom after that. Now the effects of the movie were going to use stop motion technology like the Polar Express for example, but the whole project just got shelved for being too dark. Anime, we have Disney's America. So back in the early 90s, Disney planned on building this theme park near Haymarket, Virginia. It was meant to showcase the history of the US and it was meant to have thousands of hotel rooms and housing, nine themed areas, and two million square feet just for retail. The areas were meant to be Crossroads USA, Civil War Fort, Native America, President Square, Family Farm, Enterprise, We the People, Victory Field, and State. Fair. The behemoth of a project with a $650 million budget was meant to open in 1998, but that did not happen. Upon its announcement, it had a lot of support from political officials like Governor Douglas Wilder and George Allen, but opposition to the project was a lot louder than expected from Project History America. They believed the theme park would desecrate the ground over which so many men fought and died on, but then again, the park would have honored the country's history, so was it really desecrating it? I don't really know. The American Farmland Trust opposed the project as well, and even nearby towns started changing their opinions. By 1994, Disney announced they would not build the park, and that was the end of that. Filling our number seven slot is gigantic. So I love how Disney takes all these old fairy tales and modernizes them for our time. For example, tales like Snow Queen aren't even recognized anymore despite that being the premise for Frozen. Now, Gigantic was an animated movie project of Jack and the Beanstalk, which I'm only now realizing there isn't a Disney movie for. Is there? There isn't. Now the plot was set during the age of exploration in Spain and was gonna revolve around Jack and his friendship with 11 year old giant Irma. And she would have apparently been such a character she was described as feisty, fiery, and a lot to control. Unfortunately, no matter how good the idea is, sometimes things just don't work out and that was the case for Gigantic. Disney and Pixar's president Ed Catmull announced the project was being shelved for now. And I mean, there could be a chance it makes a comeback in the future, who knows? The artwork for the film was actually super cute. 
cute, so I really hope it does come back off the shelf. Now number six is Lafitte's Island. So this project was gonna be a makeover of the Tom Sawyer Island located in Disneyland, and how they were gonna do that was by basing it on the pirate Jean Lafitte. Park goers would go into Lafitte's crypt, which would have been in a graveyard right opposite the haunted mansion. From there, you would go through a catacomb themed tunnel network under the river to the island. The tunnels would have things like Lafitte's treasure vault and numerous shipwrecks. The reason for the project being abandoned was never made public, but the project did inspire the actual pirate's lair that did come to fruition. Coming in at number five is Mort. I feel like out of everything on this list, this one hurt me the most. So this movie would have been based on the fourth Discworld book, Mort by Terry Pratchett. The plot focuses on the character of Mort who goes on to become Death's Apprentice, which isn't hard to gather if you know what the title is, Mort. Mort equals dead, it's only fitting. Now on the first mission, Mort ends up messing with everything including the fabric of time when he stops the death of a specific princess. The little concept art I've seen of the movie just looks morbid and dark in the perfect way. You know, like it's not too depressing that I can't watch it, it's just nice and gothic. It's not super clear why the project got shelved, but an artist on the movie called Sue Nicholas shared it was something to do with the rights of the novel. Apparently Disney just couldn't attain the rights to do the movie, so they obviously didn't. And number four is Rob Roger Rabbit's Hollywood. I may get a lot of slack for this in the comments, but am I the only one that wasn't really into the whole Roger Rabbit universe? Like, I know it's a cult classic and whatnot, but I just wasn't interested. I didn't care. So Disney wanted to extend Sunset Boulevard and build Roger Rabbit's Hollywood because the movie had just come out. The project was gonna have a red car trolley going up and down the street, dropping off people at a Maroon Studios replica. Now that bit would have been located where Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith is today. The area would have had three attractions. Baby Herman's Runaway Baby Buggy, Toontown Trolley, and of course Benny the Cab, but the cab later became Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin. Spielberg's company Amblin and Disney were both in a bit of a legal dispute over using the character in film, and by 1992 all future attractions were put on hold. But I mean, we still got the red trolley in Disney's California Adventure, so I mean, you know, you win some, you lose some. Filling at number three slot is Newt. This one is actually so cute, and I feel like it would have done really well, so it's annoying it never got made. So Newt's plot revolved around the last male and female blue-footed Newt's in the world. The world, as well as science and man, forces the two together so they don't die out altogether. Now initially the Newt's hate each other, but then they eventually come together in the end because they have to since it's a Disney movie. And I know what you're thinking, this sounds very similar to the plot for Rio and you are 100% correct, but then again wasn't Ants very similar to A Bug's Life? It's not like they haven't done it before. Either way, the creature of Up took the project and shelved it for his own idea, which is what ended up being Inside Out. And that movie made me cry, so I honestly don't even mind. That was a very good movie. But not to fret, because the abandoned project still makes its way into Disney films via Easter eggs. For example, in Toy Story, there's a sign in Andy's room that says Newt Crossing. Cute. Now number two is the Enchanted Snow Palace. So this wintry project was scheduled to be a dark ride at Fantasyland within Disneyland. A dark ride is one of those rides where you board those indoor ghost trains that take you throughout the ride. Now Mark Davis designed the project as a boat ride going along on a river of melting ice. You would go past scenes of Arctic wildlife, all while being under the Northern Lights, which has always been a dream of mine. When I was little, I wanted my honeymoon to be somewhere where I could see the Northern Lights, and then obviously I grew up, but I still really want to see them. Anyway, the ride would eventually take you into this land filled with snow giants and frost fairies known as the Realm of the Snow Queen. The concept art of the ride was insane, but it was eventually scrapped, but it did serve as inspiration for the Frozen Ever After ride at the Norway Pavilion during the World Showcase at Epcot. And finally, at number one is the Aristocats 2. Hello! Am I the only one who's truly appalled and very angry that they never made the Aristocats 2? Who doesn't want to watch the sequel of a cat movie? It'd be great. And yes, I know I'm 100% biased. I don't even care. So the movie was going to focus on Marie, the adorable white pink ribboned kitten from the first one who looks a lot like my own cat, so obviously I'm in love. Now the plot was going to feature some adventure by having the cats go against a jewel thief on a cruise ship. To make it a bit more interesting, they were going to have a love interest for Maria on the ship as well, and they would have fallen in love as the ship went from front 
France to Scotland, Spain, and then England. Despite how well the first movie did, Disney was worried they had come up with a plot for the sequel way too quickly. And considering how badly The Fox and the Hound 2 did, they were in no rush for another failure of a sequel. Please release it, it'll be so good. <laughs> Coming in at number 10, we have The Rainbow Road to Oz. When I was a kid, pretty much every kid knew The Wizard of Oz. No, I don't know if the new generation has seen it as much as we did, and I can't blame them if they skipped it. The Wizard of Oz was made in the 1950s. It is worse special effects than a YouTube channel that has less than a thousand followers. Trust me, the new generation is not missing much. But for its time, the movie was a massive success. It rippled through culture more than The Rock doing the rock bottom of John Cena at WrestleMania. Nowadays, if you make a movie that huge, especially if it's owned by Disney, you better believe that it's going to get a sequel, a cartoon, a toy line, and 1,000 other things that will make sure they suck the most money out of the film. But back then, having a huge success meant that the movie should stand alone in all its glory. This is the reason why the sequel to The Wizard of Oz, The Rainbow Road to Oz, was never made. The studio heads at Disney were working on the project, but it wasn't coming together. Even though the movie was fully casted and Disney had a script ready to go, there were fears that there was no way a sequel could live up to the original and would just bomb because people wouldn't accept an extension to the story. Also, apparently the script wasn't that good. But now that I have put this idea out into the universe, I'm sure someone at Disney will bring back The Wizard of Oz at Disney because Disney loves nostalgia more than I do. And guys, make sure you hit that like button because it really helps us out. Coming at number nine, we have Don Quixote. It shouldn't be a surprise that Disney has tried to make one of the most famous stories of all time and turn it into a Disney classic. I mean, we have already covered how much they love to work with nostalgia. And on top of that, do you think they wrote The Jungle Book, Snow White, Little Mermaid, Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, or Hercules? Of course not. Those are all based off of old stories or legends. So Don Quixote seems like it would be right up their alley. The man from La Mancha who would woo any woman and slay any man. He was the original bad dude that lived by the mantra, women want him and men want to be him. Now Disney would of course cut out all the sexy bits because we're trying to shove this into something that would be appropriate for a younger audience. And what would be the best way to do this? Well of course it would be to have Mickey Mouse play him. Apparently there was a squash Don Quixote project that saw the legendary Spanish knight played by the Disney mascot. I don't think Mickey pulls as much water as he once did, so if this project actually does see the light of day, I don't think we'll have him played by the famous animated mouse. Coming in a break, we have the Bremontown Musicians. Disney movies that are about giving everything up to go chase a dream are pretty normal, but back in the day, they needed to have a more conservative message than the Bremontown Musicians. Here's the backbone of the story. You have four main characters that are all getting up in age. You got a cat, a rooster, a dog, and a donkey. Now, because of their old age, they can feel themselves becoming useless on the farm, and they know sooner or later they're going to be replaced. Well, instead of waiting for Judgment Day, this motley crew decides that they will go to the big city and try and make it as musicians. Now, if you ask me, that sounds like a great story, but most Disney movies of that era were either a princess ending up with a prince or some scrappy boy becoming a king. Basically, in the end, they all have a stable life. And a movie that might have inspired kids to leave everything behind to try and make it in the unstable world of entertainment could have sent home a message that got parents a little worked up back in the 90s. Coming in at number seven, we have DuckTales the movie. DuckTales used to be huge, a show about three rambunctious humanoid ducks who went to go visit their rich uncle who would jump off a diving board into a pool filled with gold coins. Yeah, the show was made in a time before the majority of the public had a burning hatred for people who flaunted their wealth. But ignoring a duck that's literally swimming in money while others are struggling to get food on the table, DuckTales was a show that was all about adventure and mystery. The gang going to far off places to seeing what the dark corners of the earth had to offer. I loved one of the DuckTale games so much that he used to play the DuckTale game endlessly on my Sega Game Gear. I don't think I ever beat it, and now I have this urge to go back and play it. I just need to get my hands on a Sega Game Gear. But there was one DuckTales movie, Treasure of the Lost Land, which was supposed to be the first in a series of DuckTale movies. Unfortunately for DuckTales fans, the movie kind of bombed in the box office, and all future movies were thrown in the trash. Coming in at number six, we have Puss in Boots. Way before DreamWorks took the now beloved character and brought him into the shred 
Breakfast, there was a movie in the works that was supposed to star the little feline in shoes. This movie was supposed to come out in 1991, but some complications meant that it never made it to the big screen. It was going to star a little cat in big shoes in a hand drawn adventure, probably saving a princess because that's what all those stories were about back then. But I'm happy that this one never came to the light of day because now we have the Shrek Puss in Boots. Coming in number five, we have Where is Roger Rabbit? For some, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a very important part of our childhood. And when you go back to watch it now, you might be surprised that our parents let us watch it. I mean, Jessica Rabbit isn't the most child appropriate character that has ever been in a kids movie. Let's just say that if they did a remake today, she would get the Lola Bunny treatment times one million. But there were plans to bring the hyperactive rabbit and the My Way or the Highway detective back to the big screen in a movie that was called Where is Roger Rabbit? Which I assume was the same detective trying to hunt down the famous animated actor who had disappeared. This movie was slated for the early 90s, so there probably would have been just as much cleavage. Coming in at number four, we have The Nightmare Before Christmas 2. When I tell you there was a sequel to Nightmare Before Christmas that was cancelled, there are going to be a few people watching this that are going to be furious, and trust me, I'm one of them. I always pick this as my favorite Disney movie, well either Nightmare Before Christmas or Hercules. But Nightmare Before Christmas was so good and there was so much left to explore. Why did we not get more from Jack Skellington? Well, rumor has it that Disney wanted the movie, but they wanted to make one major change. Instead of having the movie all shot in stop motion animation, they wanted to move it to CG. Now obviously a big part of the movie is the look of the stop motion animation. Director Tim Burton understood this and he was the one who got Disney to change their minds and cancel the project. And I don't blame him either. It's better to have one great film than one great film and a sequel that kind of tarnishes the reputation of the first. Also, let's start an argument in the comments. Is The Nightmare Before Christmas a Christmas movie or a Halloween movie? Let me know what you think and you can't say both. Coming in number three, we have The Yellow Submarine. If Marvel has taught us anything, it's that people love collabs. Whether it's Iron Man teaming up with Spider-Man or in this case, the Beatles teaming up with Disney. Back in 2011, Disney was looking into doing a remake of the animated movie about the Beatles that came out back in the 60s. That would have been wild. For the first time since Alice in Wonderland, Disney might have made a movie that was both appropriate for kids and appealing to 20 somethings that were pumped full of psilocybin. Now, even though this seems like a no brainer, the movie was canned, mainly because the director and writer of the remake, Robert Zemeckis, just had a movie bomb. Disney loves to bring in new talent. I mean, they brought in Tika Watiti to direct Thor Ragnarok, and it was a smash hit. But they don't want to bring you in if you just laid a stinky egg at the box office. Coming in at number two, we have the Seven Dwarves. Who were these hardworking mythical creatures before they ran into Snow White as she screamed through a haunted forest? Well, they lived a full life, and Disney wanted to make that on screen canon. What's most enticing about this was it was supposed to be a Lord of the Rings style world that showcased the land that the seven dwarves were actually from with a complete backstory on why each one of them are the way that they are. It would have been so cool to see an explanation on why their personalities are so defined. But before you feel like you were robbed of a Snow White extended universe, let me tell you that these movies were supposed to be straight to DVD and were never planned for the big screen. Coming in at the number one spot, we have Monsters Inc. 2 Lost in Scaradice. You know when a movie has a full title with a colon and a pun in its name, it was far down the production line. Well, you don't know that for sure, but with the details that were leaked about this movie, it was seen that the script was done. All that needed to happen happened was Disney to give it the green light. Now, the movie was about Mike and Sully making their way over to the human world as if having one human around wasn't enough to deal with. They thought they should head to another dimension where there are billions, but their motivations were just. They wanted to give Boo a birthday present. Just picturing them doing that makes me think of Sully putting the door back together so he can see Boo one last time and I get so choked up. Ah. But when Sully and Mike Wazowski cross to the other side, they end up getting stuck in the other world. They then need to find their way back. Now the movie didn't happen because the animation studio where the writers and scripters worked, Circle 7, ended up getting closed down and thus Disney was much less interested in the project if they needed to find somewhere to have it made. Starting us off at number 10, 
Mort. It's not incredibly often that we get to see a darker side of Disney. I mean, besides the shockingly frequent plots surrounding parental death cloaked in song and dance. But truly, I mean, you'd think they would figure out how big the market for this vibe is considering the skyrocketing success of the assumed to be flop The Nightmare Before Christmas, but alas, this abandoned project will likely never see the light of day. Mort, a project that was supposed to be based on Terry Pratchett's novel of the same name, was going to follow the story of a man named Mort who becomes Death's apprentice, which already sounds pretty interesting to me. Reportedly on his first solo mission, Mort, however, However, accidentally ends up messing with the fabric of time, which results in the prevention of a death. And of course, the person he accidentally prevents from dying is a princess. Other than that, there's not much information surrounding the film, except that the creators of Moana were also apparently attached to it, and the reason behind it being dropped is fairly hush hush as well. Some have speculated that they were forced to drop the concept as they couldn't obtain the rights to the story. But but unfortunately, whatever the reason was, we will never see it. Which sucks, cause this sounds like it would have been awesome. Coming in at number 9, Dumbo 2. Some sequels are great, others are well, let's just say not so great. And although I loved Dumbo, it's hard to tell if this one would have fallen into the former or the latter of those two categories. The sequel was apparently going to take place exactly one day after where we left off in the first film and was going to follow Dumbo along with a crew of other young animals who get separated from each other in New York City. While trying to find their way back to each other, each character then learns how to fix their own problems and reportedly each animal was intended to symbolize a different aspect of growing up. Now again, I could see this maybe working out with the right writing and a good plot. I mean, Disney's no stranger to a metaphor, but I could also see it going horribly wrong fairly easily as well. Though there is no official reason as to why the production was left behind, it was pretty much just dropped in 2006 after years of delays. With that in mind, I think we will just have to trust them on this one and assume that it was not going to be a great addition to the franchise. Coming in at number 8, My Peoples. As rumor has it, this next film was scrapped in favor of Chicken Little and well, I will let you decide if that was the right call or not. My Peoples was reportedly going to be a story about two families who hate each other, the Harpers and McGee's, whose children, Elgin and Rose, fall in love. Think like a Disney version of Romeo and Juliet, just, you know, without all the death and stuff. Said to be set in Texas during the 1940s, apparently there was also a large focus on dolls in the show, as Elgin liked to create dolls, and at one point there was going to be some kind of crazy mishap which would bring the dolls to life and they were going to help bring the two families together. Which I mean honestly sounds like a good premise for a movie if you ask me. Again, it's really just Romeo and Juliet with a happy ending. In terms of why it was cancelled, it's a little unclear. Barry Cook, who was the driving force behind the production, says he partly blamed himself for it being struck down, though he holds no bitter feelings towards those who inevitably shut it down. The only real question is, would it have been better or worse than Chicken Little? I guess we'll never find out. Next up at number 7, Pinocchio 2. When it comes to the classics, Pinocchio is definitely one of Disney's most beloved tales. I mean, it was a hit when it was released 83 years ago, and it remains an iconic story to this day. And when something does that well for so long, sometimes it's better to just leave it alone. Apparently when the sequel was still in the works, it was going to, of course, focus on Pinocchio as a real boy and was going to look at the question of why life appears to be unfair sometimes. Which I mean doesn't quite give the same excitement as a puppet who turns into an actual human being, but hey. Now to be fair, there have been some remakes of the original story, so Disney has definitely attempted some modern adaptations on the original. But even so, they haven't been super well received to my knowledge, so I imagine cancelling the sequel to this classic was probably the right call. Coming in at number 6, Fantasia 2006. Had this movie come to fruition, it would have been the third installment of the anthology, and from the sounds of it, it could have actually 
actually been really cool. Now, unlike some of the others on this list, it wasn't cut in some grand dramatic outrage. The truth is we actually have no clue why it was cut. All you can find online is that the reason it was dropped is unknown, which could either be a very boring answer or a very interesting one. By the time productions came to a halt, there had been a few proposed segments, and so they released the four shorts to the public and decided to just leave it at that. Allegedly, there were plans to use music from all over the world for this movie, not just classical European pieces, and they were also going to feature singing voices rather than just instrumentation, which would have definitely given it that special bit of Disney sparkle. But alas, I guess it was not meant to be. Coming in at number 5, Monsters Inc. 2 Lost in Scaradice. Now, I'm a Monsters Inc. girly through and through, so I'll admit I'm a little curious about what this one could have been. Apparently, the story was going to be set after the first film and followed Mike and Sully trying to visit Boo for her birthday in the human world. However, the twist was that Boo's family had moved, and so the movie turned into an adventure to track her down. Now, it's unclear what kind of shenanigans would have ensued or how much later this would have been set from the original, but I do think it could have been interesting to see Boo actually be able to talk to Sully and Mike and have her try to explain to her family who these strange hairy monsters stalking them across the globe are. Although that being said, most of her charm was that she was so little. so. Who knows? Of course, we will never know if it could have been good or not, as the project was scrapped after Disney shut down the studio making it in 2006, called Circle 7, and in its place released the prequel Monsters University. So what do you think? Would you see the sequel, or do you think it was better left abandoned? Next up at number 4. Brady Cat. Something that I never thought I would see in the same sentence would be Disney and film noir thriller. But apparently there was once a time when a comedic version of a Hitchcock style movie was in the works. Which is enticing to say the least. According to the little info you can find, the abandoned project was going to surround Oscar, a skittish, privileged domestic cat living a rather dull and unexciting life, who one way or another gets wrapped up with Karina the cockatoo and somehow becomes involved in a missing persons case. But I guess the higher ups at Disney thought their target demographic wouldn't have much interest in a G rated thriller mystery a la Hitchcock, and so the film was cancelled. Allegedly, they were also concerned they weren't going to be able to sell merch or create spin offs from it either. I mean, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a great movie to me. If anything, I'm sure there are tons of Disney adults or parents who would have liked it, and at the very least, I am sure it would have been better than adding a third or fourth movie to an existing franchise, but hey, what do I know? Coming in at number three, The Search for Mickey Mouse. Originally intended as a movie to celebrate Mickey Mouse's 75th anniversary, or birthday if you will. As the title suggests, it was going to be about a missing Mickey Mouse whose friends Minnie, Goofy, Donald, and Basil of Baker Street go on a journey to find him. Naturally, on their great travels, they were going to run into a slew of other Disney characters like Alice, Peter Pan, and Aladdin, who would no doubt help them in their great search for the missing mouse. However, in a rather uneventful twist of events, this movie was cancelled simply due to a straight up lack of ideas. Apparently writers just could not get an interesting story out and so they decided to scrap it all together. Now I have to say that's got to be some intense writers block if not one person can think of a good idea. Plus there have been some movies since that weren't all that groundbreaking ideas wise so you have to wonder just how bad the ideas were to make them want to Toss out the whole story and never look back. Coming in at number two, Rumple Stiltskin. While they are certainly heavily watered down, many of the original Disney films are actually based off Brothers Grimm tales, like The Little Mermaid, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty, just to name a few. And apparently, at one point in time, the tale of Rumple Stiltskin was on the table too. Now, for those who don't know this story, the Spark Notes version is essentially there's a man who lies to a king, bragging that his daughter can spin straw into gold. The girl then becomes the king's prisoner where she is locked in a room filled with straw and the king threatens to kill her if she does not spin all the straw into gold by morning. Then along comes Rumpelstiltskin, an imp who makes a deal with the girl to spin the straw into gold for a price. However, after the first time, the king now 
thinking she can spin straw, starts demanding more of the girl, still threatening her with death if she can't complete the task. And so she must demand more of the imp until eventually the price is her firstborn. From there, the story then becomes a bet as to whether the girl, who's now the queen, can guess the imp's name in order to keep her firstborn. I mean, honestly, I think this would have made a great movie, so it's really too bad that this one was abandoned. And last up in our number one spot, Wildlife. During the late 90s, this film began production and the plan was to show a more mature side of Disney, centered around 1970s American culture. In terms of plot, it sounds like it was going to be about two high strung competitive talent seekers, Red and Kitty Glitter, who were on the hunt for a new star for their club called Wildlife. Through a series of events, the pair discover Ella the elephant from the zoo and in some kind of strange electrocution scenario involving Involving loose wires on the stage, she becomes a confident diva who is destined to achieve riches and fame. However, in the end, Ella yearns for the simple life she led at the zoo, of course, causing some complications for her managers. Now, according to what I found out about this abandoned project, it had easily the most dramatic ending than all of the others on this list. As I previously mentioned, it was quite a bit more mature than Disney usually went, allegedly filled with what one might call adult humor, and apparently during the 1999 viewing, vice chairman at the time Roy Disney was so disgusted and outraged by the film that he ordered it to be shut down immediately. And that was that. It never saw the light of day. But I have to admit, that makes me kind of want to watch it even more. Like what was so inappropriate about this movie that caused so much drama? I mean, let's be honest, we've all seen some weird moments in Disney movies that make you question how they got past editing. So what made this one a write-off? I guess we'll never know. Starting us off at number 10 is Lake Buena Vista Airport. If there is one thing that Disney does best, it's branding their empire. And once upon a time, an airport, of all things, was a part of the Disney dynasty. Dynasty. You see, when Walt was first trying to create Epcot, the community, not the theme park, he wanted a regional airport with four runways. This vision did not quite come to fruition, but what we did get was the 1971 Buena Vista Airport. This boutique airport, if you will, was only used by two airlines and was meant for Disney guests and employees, and the biggest feature it became known for was that when you wish upon a star played after landing thanks to small grooves in the runway. However, cute factor aside, despite Walt's grand plans, the dream began to die in the 1980s with the construction of the monorail. The airport, now surrounded on either side, became dangerous to use, and so eventually no more flights were allowed in or out. Nowadays, the abandoned airport is mostly used for storage and parking rather than an attraction for the public, but it's said that Walt's abandoned plane is hidden somewhere on on the lot, and who knows, maybe his ghost is still in there. Next up at number nine, the Wonders of Life Pavilion. I don't know about you, but when I think about Disney, I don't usually jump to health education. Well, as it turns out, the plan for the original Epcot included a pavilion that was to be dedicated to life and health, which eventually made its debut in 1989. The main attraction of this pavilion was called Body Wars, which was a ride that aimed to simulate what it felt like to travel through the human bloodstream, which had I had the chance, I would for sure have wanted to get on to live out my magic school bus dreams. However, despite running for nearly 18 years, the Wonders of Life Pavilion closed without any explanation in January 2007. At the time of its closure, there were of course tons of rumors, however the true reason has never been verified. It was just boarded up and closed off. which. Is definitely a bit suspicious, but could there be something they are hiding from the public that's locked away? I guess we'll never know. Next up at number eight, Pirates of the Caribbean. As the legend goes, during the construction for the Florida version of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, a welder named George was killed in an accident. Now, the exact accident that happened to George does vary depending on who you ask. Some say he was crushed by a falling beam, while others say that he fell from the burning city portion of the ride and died as a result. But no matter how he died, everyone can agree on one thing, that he remains haunting the ride and 
terrorizing anyone who dares disrespect him. It's said George will stop the ride if he hears you say that you don't believe he's real. And superstitious cast members will greet George when they arrive and say goodbye when they leave to try and stay on his good side. So with that being said, while it's not technically prohibited, it's not exactly somewhere you want to mess with. So if you do decide to take your chances, make sure you don't piss off George. You never know what might happen. Next up at number seven, Haunted Mansion. This next one is a story from a visitor at Disney World in Florida while riding the Haunted Mansion who claims they witnessed a ghost and allegedly have the photo to prove it. Quote, as you'll see in the photo, it appears as though a young boy is peeking his head out of the doom buggy and looking directly at me. Not only was he not there when I took the pic, there wasn't a boy of this age within 20 people in front of me in line. And as you can see, he's only a few doom buggies in front of me. Not only that, What's he doing looking at me? There is no flash and no visible light coming from me. It's all infrared and invisible to the naked eye. So could it be that the haunted mansion is in fact haunted by real ghosts? Just tread carefully if you try to find out for yourself. You never know what they could want from you. Next up at number six, Walt's apartment. Depending on how much of a Disney fan you are, you may or may not be familiar with a certain apartment that's located above the firehouse on Main Street at Disneyland. The reason for this apartment was initially nothing terribly exciting, but simply because Mr. Disney himself wanted a place to stay that was on the property to make those late nights and early mornings a little easier. Now, to be fair, Walt's apartment isn't really prohibited anymore. You can go see it if you like, but the question is, should you? Well, nowadays a light is always left on in the front window. According to the legend, this wasn't always the case. It's said that one day a cast member looking after the apartment tried to turn the light off before leaving. However, after leaving the building, she looked up only to notice that the light was still on upstairs. Confused, but assuming she must have forgotten. She went back up to turn it off and came back downstairs. But once again, it was on. So she went up again, unplugged the lamp, only to find it once again still somehow back on by the time she came downstairs. The final time she went up, she heard an angry voice saying, quote, I'm still here. And she was so frightened, she ran away and never returned back to work. Who could that voice have belonged to? No one knows for sure, but the light remains on so as to never anger it again. Coming in at number five, Dolly's Dip. In 1984, Regina Young, or Dolly, as she liked to go by, was tragically killed while riding the Matterhorn. It seems there was a malfunction in Dolly's seatbelt, resulting in her falling out of the bobsled and being struck by an oncoming sled. The family eventually settled with the park, and the park simultaneously changed the kinds of seatbelts used for that attraction. However, the park says that the two events are unrelated. Now, of course, the Matterhorn remains a public ride, so you're free to take your chances on it, but be warned, it's said that the ghost of Dolly haunts the ride, specifically at the location she was killed. Referred to as Dolly's Dip, visitors and employees alike say they have been haunted by her presence while inside. Some say they can feel her watching them, while others claim to have seen a full-bodied apparition. But unless you're looking for a little paranormal action on your next Disney trip, then I would suggest lining up for a different ride. Coming in at number four, Nara Dreamland. Located in Japan, Nara Dreamland opened its doors to the public back in 1961. Now, from the get-go, the plan for this park was to be a part of the Disney franchise. In fact, Kunizo Matsuo, president of the Matsuo Entertainment Company, apparently met with Walt Disney to discuss the attraction with the plan of it being an official Disney park in mind. However, allegedly, after disagreements over the licensing fees for using the Disney characters, there was a huge falling out and Nara Dreamland was officially 
not an affiliated park. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what the hell is this doing on a Disney list? Well, despite its lack of official Disney representation, it sure resembles a Disney park if I've ever seen one. Or rather, it did prior to its 2006 closure. Attractions like a large Matterhorn Mountain, Castle, and even a monorail found, and for many years it remained a ghost town, overgrown with nature and filled with an eerie presence. This of course caught the attention of Disney and horror fans alike for a while, but you had to be incredibly careful, as it was said visitors could be fined and arrested for trespassing into the abandoned property. However, as of 2017, the former theme park was demolished. But make no mistake, it's still not somewhere you should go poking around. While it was abandoned, some that snuck in complained of feeling like they were being watched or haunted by an angry entity, and it's believed that those same ghosts still haunt the grounds where it used to stand. Coming in at number three, Nighttime Trespassers. In 1966, 19 year old Thomas Guy Cleveland tried to sneak into Anaheim's Disneyland by scaling the park's outer fence and climbing along the monorail track. Now, why he was trying to sneak in after hours, we don't really know. But nonetheless, his devious plan all came to a halt when a nearby security guard noticed him. At first, he approached to get him to leave, but then he noticed a monorail was making its way along the tracks and so he began yelling at Cleveland to get out of the way. At this point, Cleveland jumped and landed on a fiberglass canopy beneath the track to try and clear it. But unfortunately, the canopy did not keep him safe. From there, the 25 kilometer an hour monorail struck Cleveland and dragged his body for 40 feet down the track. By the time the monorail had made a complete stop, his body had been torn to pieces. So whatever you do, for the love of God, don't try to scale the wall and sneak in at night. It might be the last night you ever have. Coming in at number two, Discovery Island. Originally called Treasure Island, after the 1950 film of the same name, this Disney park opened to the public in 1974 as a premier tourist destination for Disney fans of all ages. Accessible only by resort boat or Disney cruise lines, the original park revolved around the theme of shipwrecks, secret caves, and buried treasure. However, in April 1976, Disney decided to rebrand to the new Discovery Discovery Island. This rebranding waved goodbye to pirate boats and treasure and instead welcomed rich flora and fauna hoping to invite a more relaxing atmosphere all while simultaneously showcasing and protecting Florida's local wildlife. Which to be fair, it did for a while. Discovery Island was accredited by the Association of Zoological Parks and Aquariums and at its peak housed over 500 endangered species. However, much to the public's surprise, Discovery Island Island was abandoned in 1999. The animals were relocated to a new park, Animal Kingdom, and the island park has remained a ghost town ever since. Now, while it's sort of unclear as to why it shut down, some reasons include wild roaming alligators, along with deadly bacteria found in the park's waters. And while all of that might sound intriguing, I promise you, you do not want to try and visit this one. Walt Disney World has banned all outings to the park. In fact, you're not allowed to get within 50 feet of its shoreline, and legal action can be taken if you're found trespassing. And that's not just a threat, people have actually been banned from all Disney parks for life for attempting to visit. So yeah, if I were you, I would steer clear of this one. And last up in our number one spot, River Country. After opening as the first water park at the Walt Disney World Resort in 1976, River Country was a popular destination for many years. And out of all of the places on this list, this one definitely has the wildest backstory. Controversy around the water park started to bubble up back in 1980, when a boy tragically died there due to an amoeba that was found in the water. The amoeba in question managed to kill him by attacking his brain and nervous system. However, Disney was absolved of the blame due to the fact that that specific amoeba could have bred in any fresh water. But 
the story's not done yet. Fast forward two years to 1982, and another boy died at River Country, this time from drowning on the Whoopenhaller slide. This time, Disney was sued by the family of the boy who claimed that there was no proper warning about how deep the water was. And a lifeguard testified, admitting that they had to routinely save dozens of people from that slide on a daily basis. Even so, the park remained open. Then in 1989, another boy drowned there. However, it wasn't until the events in September of 2001 went down that Disney was forced to close the park due to the nationwide tourism cutback. From that day forward, the doors have remained shut and the park has been closed off to the public, though some believe that those who have lost their lives still roam around haunting the grounds. Mm -hmm.